So the Fed is finally convincing markets that they're serious about taming inflation, that they're going to keep rates higher. The interesting thing that what Powell said, so at the recent you know meeting last uh, last week, he said four things that were very impactful to the markets and very impactful to investors and their outlook moving forward. One. Welcome back to the Thinking Crypto Podcast, your home for cryptocurrency news and interviews. With me today is Greg Dickerson, who is a real estate investor, uh, consultant, uh, entrepreneur. And Greg, there's so many titles, but uh, you obviously have a huge knowledge of the markets. Yeah, yeah, Tony, it's good to see you. Um, well, Greg, you know, as the Fed continues their tightening cycle and uh, they've had some very interesting updates where they paused rate hikes and they went back to rate hikes. Now they're pausing again. I would love to get your thoughts on what is the Fed doing here as best as you can tell us and, and their strategy. Is it still they're going very aggressive against inflation or they're ramping down? Yeah. So, you know, you and I have been having these conversations for, I don't know, about two years now, right? I think so. Yeah. You know, pretty much during the entire Fed hiking cycle since inflation, you know, is went out of control. So we're seeing disinflation. Inflation's come down a little bit, but we still have a ways to go. So the Fed is finally convincing markets that they're serious about taming inflation, that they're going to keep rates higher. The interesting thing that what Powell said, so at the recent, you know, meeting last uh last week. He said four things that were very impactful to the markets and very impactful to investors and their outlook moving forward. One, he said, we're going to carefully evaluate the data and our policy moving forward. He said carefully a number of times because he understands the impact that these higher rates, the longer they stay higher, can have on the markets, especially the credit markets. So that carefully was a very interesting thing that he said. The other thing he said was um, neutral is much higher than where we are from here. Mm -hmm. And he was asked the question, well, where is neutral? Uh, you know, that R star, that neutral Fed funds rate. And he said, we will know it by its works. So what he's saying is it's higher than where we are now. We don't know how high that's gonna be, but once we get there, we'll know it by its works. In other words, it's gonna put, you know, it's gonna put a lot of pressure on, on credit markets, you know, moving forward. And the other thing he said was, you know, a lot of what we're experiencing in inflation being sticky at this point, he said, we have seen a lot of progress. He said, however, the economy is strong. The job markets is str are strong. So that's kind of keeping inflationary pressures higher for longer. Mm. So uh, and that was the last thing that he said was he said that there may be a time when it's appropriate to reduce rates, but that time is not now. So, you know, those were the, you know, the things that he really said that were really impactful to the markets. So what, what was happening is along the way, markets were pricing rate cuts like every quarter. So the Fed would hike and they would say, well, next quarter they're going to cut. Uh, that pretty much happened up until the last meeting. And what we've seen now is the, the markets are pricing out rate cuts into September of next year wow. uh, and have pushed them out. So I think the markets have finally gotten serious about taking the Fed at their word and not fighting the Fed. You don't fight the Fed on the way up and you don't fight the Fed on the way down. And the markets have been fighting the Fed the whole way on the way down. The markets have won that fight to this point. So now we're at that critical mass because the Fed is really handcuffed. So a lot of people said, well, Powell seemed you know, visibly unnerved at that meeting, that he didn't seem his usual polished, smooth self, that he seemed a bit rattled. And the reason is, is because the Fed knows that they're handcuffed. With inflation where it's at, if they take the foot off the off the brakes at all, so they have the brakes on the, the economy right now by raising interest rates. When the economy runs hot, you raise rates to cool it off. When the economy cools off um, or, you know, runs hot, you put the brakes on when it's, you know, when you want it to speed up a little bit, starts cooling, you lower rates and you put the foot on the gas. So what he knows and what the FOMC know are that, you know, we really can't control the inflationary uh, environment that we're in now, energy, you know, jobs, things like that. Their policy has had no effect on that. They can't really control that, food prices, those types of things. So if we get into a situation where the credit markets start to crack, again, carefully monitoring financial conditions uh, and, and, you know, the environment, there's really nothing they can do. They can't cut rates because inflation will just skyrocket again and run through the roof. So they're in a very difficult spot. Yeah, it's interesting because, um, you know, to your point, Greg, like, 
the markets have been looking historically and they've said, you know, hey, the anytime the Fed has paused, they've never gone back to raising. However, this time is different. They have uh, continued raising and, and they recently said they're pausing, but they plan to keep on the table the ability to raise. So we're in a different cycle or different times. And uh, I'm, you know, what what does your gut tell you that uh, will they raise maybe a few more times and then pause ultimately pause for this cycle and then eventually cut maybe, I don't know, end of 2024? Yeah, so they're keeping rate hikes on the table. They didn't say they're not taking that off the table. Will they actually do it? You know, we don't know. We'll just have to wait and see what the data looks like. So as long as inflation is under, you know, is remaining, you know, kind of where it's at, leveled off, not spiking, I don't think that gives them ammunition to raise rates. If the job market is still, you know, relatively, you know, strong where it's at, I don't think that's going to give them, you know, ammunition to really raise rates. So I think what the Fed is looking at is, you know, some of these things are kind of doing the job for them. Like inflation is going to naturally cool the economy. At some point, you should reach, you know, a, a tipping point with the consumer where they start to pull back a little bit because of, you know, rising costs. So they're kind of looking for inflation to do a little bit for them. And, you know, that was an important guidance that they gave the markets, you know, were that, hey, we're still ready to raise rates if we have to. I think 12 of the 19 members said that they could see a future rate hike. Um, seven of them said they didn't see that. And of course, we get all the Fed speakers now that the meeting's over and Powell's coming out this week, you know, to testify to Congress and all that. You won't hear much more different than what they've said. So really, they're data dependent. It's going to depend on the data. But the one thing they can't do right now with inflation where it's at is they can't cut. They can't ease monetary policy with, with where rates are. And I think the markets are understanding that. And one, you know, one of the biggest pressures on the markets right now is the uh, the yield on the 10-year. That's putting a lot of pressure on equity markets. In the past, you and I have talked about, look, politics does sometimes play a part in this and some of the Fed decisions, not all of it and 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 just a little bit. But next year's the election year. And I'm sure Biden and the Democrats will want to go into that year looking good, right? And I think Republicans, if Republicans were in power as well, um, because having recession, inflation, all these things looming, it's not going to be good for your respective party and so forth. Do you think there's this pressure on Powell to, as well from the presidential side and, and the Democrats to say, hey, we got to make this thing look good for next year. Do you think there's a, a, a layer to that? So, you know, the Fed says they're outside of all that. They say that they're that they're independent. They don't, you know, politics doesn't come into play. And, you know, it kind of looks that way because they've been hiking, you know, while, you know, at odds with the federal government spending money, you know, Bidenomics and the Inflation Reduction Act. I mean, you know, so there's still fiscal policy is still putting putting the foot on the gas while monetary policy has got the foot on the brakes. So, you know, those two things have been at odds. Mm -hmm. The interesting thing is right now for Biden, you know, if you talk about the election cycle, you know, there's a 78% dissatisfaction with the administration in regards to the economy. So 78% of the people disapprove, disapprove of Biden's handling of the economy and, you know, the administration. So this, you know, I'm not being political. It's just what it is. That's what the polls are right now, because inflation is hurting people. People are feeling the impacts. You know, the administration will say, oh, well, prices have come down. Inflation's not as bad as it was. People aren't fooled. Gas is rising again. Oil is up. Food is up. Uh, services are up. You know, with the labor union strikes we're seeing, vehicle prices are going to remain strong. Housing is still way overinflated in a lot of areas and, you know, hasn't corrected yet. Uh, you know, and interest rates are climbing. So that's that's putting even more pressure on people that are living on credit, borrowing, you know, things like that. Although on the other side of the coin, you know, it's increased and boosted savings for a lot of people. But, um, you know, they can't fake their way through this. This is a very different time. It's a very different paradigm. And, you know, Powell wants to get rid of the Fed put. So the Fed put is the markets knowing, investors knowing that the Fed's going to backstop them and jump in anytime the markets have a problem. He wants to put to put an end to that. And I think that's the message that he sent, you know, last week. So from a political standpoint, I think you're going to see, you know, Biden try to do what he can with, you know, student loan forgiveness, you know, going and protesting with the, uh, you know, with the union workers, you know, supporting the labor market, continuing to spend and try to give, you know, as much money as he can to individuals to try to buy votes, because that's what it is. 
you know, just like Republicans would do the same thing if they were in office. So I think you're going to see the political pressure from that end. I don't think you're going to see the Fed play into that because they can't. I mean, their hands literally are tied and inflation is the worst enemy of the, uh, you know, election cycle this year right now for any any sitting president. Yeah, absolutely. You know, in the past, we talked about uh, immigration uh, as a tool to fight inflation. Um, do you think there's a layer to that happening right now? I know this is a complex question because there's so many moving parts to it, but uh, with migrants and or like, for example, New York City, where I'm close to, uh, there's they have a issue here. And is, But is that part of like the strategy to help fight inflation in some of these large cities? Yeah, so I think he's opening the floodgates a little bit to try to bring workers into this country to help because, again, there's still more jobs than there are people w- willing to take them. So that's keeping pressure on prices. And and yeah, I mean, so if the big three, the you know, automakers could just get rid of all their union employees and hire immigrants to do the work at half the price, I mean, you know, that would solve the problem in the expense of moving, you know, out of the United States to manufacture in Mexico. So you know, that's always been a big provider of labor in the construction trades and manufacturing, you know, things like that. Um, the problem is, you know, our immigration system is just, it's a broken mess. And it seems to me, you know, uh, bring bring people that want to come to this country and get them legal, get them on the books, let them serve in the military, let them work the jobs that Americans don't want to do uh, or aren't, or there aren't enough Americans to do because with the new gig economy and, you know, technology and things like that, there just aren't enough uh, blue collar workers out there to fill these jobs. Um, so I think, you know, they're seeing some of that as a possible solution, but they've got, they don't have a system to get them in and get them legalized and get them on the books. Mm. Yeah. And it's funny how that, you know, there's the economic layer, there's the political layer, but, uh, from an economic layer, you know, it's, it's not until you had brought it up when we spoke, um, a, a few times, where I really started researching that and thinking about that and seeing that that is a way to combat inflation. And Oh, yeah. I mean, we can't produce enough houses. We can't produce enough cars. We can't produce enough goods and services. Any restaurant you go to, they're closed one or two days a week, pretty much all over the country because there's no help or they're limiting their hours, you know, or, they're you know, the service is just not good because they can't get people. So, yeah, you bring people in that want to work, that want to be part of the country, want to be part of the system. They want to be legal. They want to be on the books. Now, there are, you know, obviously another element here and there, but that's a very small percentage. The vast majority of these people want to come to this country. They just want to provide for their family. They want a living and they want to contribute. Let's bring them in, man. That's how this country was built. Um, so let's talk about the impact on the markets. If you can share the charts, we can start maybe with the stock market and move to Bitcoin and Ethereum, for example. Um, you know, what are you seeing in the short term, um, given the Fed going back and forth? raising, pausing, and, uh, you know, your predictions on that. So I want to put a little perspective around all these conversations. So this is the history of the Fed funds rate. Okay. So when we're talking about peaks and valleys, you can see in the 90s, I bought my first house in 1990, interest rates, late 80s, early 90s spiked. Um, Mm -hmm. And, you know, interest rates around nine and three quarters percent there. And the housing market was cooling off and, you know, kind of going into a, a very soft period from 1990 to 95. OK, and so were the markets. They were struggling a little bit. And, you know, Fed cut rates, things changed. 1995, things started heating up a little bit again. Um, rates kind of held steady. Then you had the dot com bust of 2000. And then, you know, in response, the Fed started cutting rates, uh, you know, down to the lows of 2004 and five. That was the peak of the real estate market uh, in my area when rates were at their lowest. And, you know, why did the real estate market tank? 0405, they started raising rates and the same thing, you know, equity markets kind of followed suit, but this was more on the real estate market. Then we have 07, 08, and then we know what happened. We went to zero, zero interest rate environment, uh, 2018, uh, 2016, 17, and 18, the Fed started hiking again. That put severe pressure on the markets, including Bitcoin. Then now, you know, the Fed, uh, after that pandemic, dropped rates again, stayed at those zero interest rates for a long time, now the rates have spiked. So I'm showing you this for a couple of reasons. Bitcoin was created and cryptocurrency was created in response to the 2008, 2009 financial crisis. So Bitcoin has never existed. Cryptocurrency has never existed in a Fed tightening cycle, higher for longer, or a a bear market economic downturn cycle 
The pandemic obviously was an anomaly and we saw how it acted there. It was a black swan. Mm -hmm. So if you start looking at this 2016, 2017, 2018, well, what happened to Bitcoin? 2016, 2017, 2018 is, is, you know, it ran up. And then that 2016, 2017, 2018 hiking cycle is when, you know, Bitcoin started dying. So mm -hmm. as soon as the Fed started raising rates and liquidity was being pulled out of the markets, you know, Bitcoin had its, you know, had that big downturn from that 2017 peak down to the 2018 bottom. Mm -hmm. Fed started, you know, lowering rates again. Bitcoin started peaking again. And up until 2020, we had the pandemic and it dropped. So, you know, you've seen since the bottom of 2018, where Bitcoin bottomed at 3,100, the bottom of 2020, where it bottomed at 3,900, you know, maybe $4,000. And it was off to the races after that because zero interest rates and trillions of dollars put into the economy here, um, pushing prices up. Now we're in a Fed hiking cycle. Remember back in, you know, 2021 when you and I were talking and I said, I'm at Thanksgiving telling all my family to get out. Mm -hmm. And I was getting a lot of hate on your channel because I was saying, look, it's time to get out. Bitcoin's a risk asset. And people were saying, you know, Bitcoin is not a risk asset. It's outside traditional markets and it's, you know, macro environment doesn't matter. Well, sure enough, you know, uh, we've seen the effects of Fed tightening. We've seen the effects of the, you know, macroeconomic business cycles. The interesting thing is Bitcoin bottomed out initially back in June of 2022 at that 17,700 plus or minus whatever exchange you're looking at and kind of ranged from there and, you know, rallied a little bit, you know, during that Do Kwan era. And then when, you know, when uh, Luna failed, you know, we had a little bit of a pullback, but it's kind of still stayed in that 18,000 to $20,000 range, right? Mm -hmm. Until FTX. This was FTX right here, November, 2022. And right. then we got that, you know, final capitulation down to 15, 5, 15, 6. So even a Fed tightening cycle, even in a macroeconomic, uh, you know, uh, business cycle of a downturn, Bitcoin probably without FTX would have held in that 18 to 20,000 range, which we've been able to maintain above ever since. So with Bitcoin right now, I've got some, you know, trend lines drawn here and Fibonacci retracement levels. Uh, you know, it retraced all the way back to the 316 never really got above that. But the interesting thing is, is that right now we're holding on that August high during the Do Kwan era back in 2022. And then this, you know, February high right here, I'll take some of this stuff off so we can kind of look at it a little bit easier, you know, with this macro trend line that, you know, ultimately we could come down and test if, uh, you know, if, if we don't get any improving conditions and things just kind of move along because what's happened is you've got your low, then you put in a higher low and a higher low. So right now we've put in an equal higher low. Some are arguing maybe a lower low, but it's equal. So if this concurrent move here breaks that low, we put in a lower low, you could see a continuation down, you know, to this $20,000 range again, where that consolidation was, you know, especially if we break below that, uh, that $25,000 August high and then reject below that. You know, the other thing you had was a, you know, higher, lower high, uh, you know, a higher, you know, lower, higher, low, uh, lower, higher, high, another lower, higher, high, and another lower, higher, high, kind of a little bit above this last one. And I say lower, higher, high, because, you know, these levels here are the higher, higher highs you need to take out as you go along. Right. And, you know, if you get ETF approvals and things like that, these are the levels you're going to have to get past um, in order for Bitcoin to continue. You know, when you're looking at these, you know, highs that you have to take out 32,000. Then you've got a little bit around here around that 40,000. Then you've got a big one here at 48. Then you've got that 51. And then you've got that, you know, 59. And you've got 69. These are all areas of profit taking where people, a lot of people bought in, got stuck. And as soon as we get back there, a lot of people are going to sell. They're going to get out, walk away, and they're never going to come back to, you know, Bitcoin or crypto again. And, uh, you know, so right now, without any kind of a catalyst, without an ETF approval, without, you know, some big shift in the macro risk off Fed tightening environment we're in right now, rising yields on, you know, two years and 10 years, rising dollar, rising oil inflation, you know, until some of that changes, you know, Bitcoin's just going to kind of range, I believe, eventually testing that $20,000 level again, 
and just kind of range in that 20, you know, to $25,000 level, or it could stay right here. It's been holding up at that $25,000 to $30,000 range, and it could range in there for a while. And do you think next year with the having, and given the context though you mentioned, we, we are in a very different uh, cycle right now with tightening and obviously record inflation and things like that. Um, do you think we see some sort of rally next year? Uh, but to your point, it may depend on the, the what happens with global liquidity. It really does, you know, because the having is largely a hype cycle. I think a lot of people that that mattered to have left, have left, right? They're just, you know, the new retail investor is not coming into the market. So I think if you get some ETF approvals and it brings new liquidity in the market, that narrative could could potentially, you know, pump prices a little bit. But we're going to find out, you know, if we don't get any kind of catalyst like an ETF approval and we just go into the having business as usual right now, I mean, this is going to be the biggest test of, you know, Bitcoin, you know, in this environment. And there's still a lot of ability to manipulate price by institutional investors, by Tether, Binance, you know, the, you know, the, the players that are in the game that can pump the price you know, into that happening and afterwards to try to bring, you know, more retail into, into the game. But right now the retail investor is just, they're just gone. Um, you know, they're just not here right now until we get any kind of, you know, excitement or activity. But generally, obviously, you know, the history is the halvings do uh, pump the price after the halving, you know, price, price generally pumps, hits a all time high, then you get the blow off top and it, you know, it runs the cycle all over again. You get ETF approvals, you know, you get these different things happening. I think it could be a different paradigm to where Bitcoin could start leveling off and not have those extremes, you know, in terms of the halvings and things like that. And, you know, a lot of people want to, you know, bring up scarcity and reduced supply, you know, limit, you know, max supply, cap supply, limited supply, you know, as we get to having less Bitcoins produced, those types of things. You know, that's great. But scarcity only matters if there's enough demand. You can have the most scarce asset, asset in the world and nobody wants it. It doesn't matter. Right. So that's what we're seeing right now, because the question is, why isn't, you know, if Bitcoin, if the halving's coming up, there's only 21 million. It's such a scarce asset. How come price isn't responding appropriately? Because it's a risk asset. It trades with the markets, um, you know, and it's all about supply and demand. And right now the liquidity is moving into other areas. The money supply is shrinking. So that's taking, you know, it's taking capital away from the risk, you know, uh, risk assets. Mm -hmm. But here's the here's the big news. So I'm very bullish on long term on Bitcoin. OK, mm -hmm. and this is why. So number one, cryptocurrency has been labeled now as a legitimate asset class. Uh, there's been new tax laws uh, in terms of clarifying how to treat these things on your tax returns. Who's a dealer? Who's not? We're starting to get a little clarity there. We're going to have an understanding of what are securities and what are, you know, as we continue to move through the regulatory environment and the SEC issues and things like that, the FASB rules have changed, which is huge yeah. for corporations and institutions that want to hold you know Bitcoin on their balance sheet. That's going to be huge. And then as soon as you get an ETF approval, whenever that comes, whether it comes this year, we don't know, uh, or it comes next year, we don't know. There's some thinking that as long as Gensler is in office, we won't see an approval uh, as long as he's the chair you know, of the SEC. But I think at some point you're going to see resolution with Coinbase. And, you know, uh, that's one of the biggest hurdles, I think, holding up approval is that is that, you know, resolution with Coinbase and their lawsuits. Once that gets resolved and you have a you know custodian that is is good in the eyes of the SEC, I think some of these things will get approved, if not all of them. Uh, then you're bringing all kinds of capital into the market. You've got a legitimate asset class with its own 1099. And there is a difference between Bitcoin and crypto, but Bitcoin is a cryptocurrency. It's the world's first cryptocurrency. So it is, um, you know, what it is, but it's different than altcoins and, you know, other tokens out there. But from an industry standpoint, it's treated the same. From a tax standpoint, it's treated the same as an asset class. So I think those ETFs will bring a lot more um, institutional exposure as well as the individual now mom and pop that have the 401k, the IRA, because their investment advisors are all going to be pushing them to allocate to Bitcoin and, ET and uh, Ethereum once those spot ETFs get approved. So, you know, I think that's all good for Bitcoin. And I think that will help take a lot of that exponential volatility to the downside out of the equation in the long run. Right. Yeah. Everyone's, you know, thinking we may see some sort of approval of an ETF. 
uh, this coming Q4, but we'll have to wait and see. Um, no guarantees. Um, so let's talk about the stock market. Uh, what are you seeing here? It looks like Dow Jones. Yeah, so we've got the Dow. And again, you know, I've taken this, you know, October low and did a Fibonacci retracement and it broke above the 786, which is your last line of resistance generally for, you know, any kind of a rally um, retracement from lows. Generally, when it gets above that and confirms, it continues on. Well, you know, the Dow lost that level, you know, the NASDAQ lost that level, and the S&P has lost that level. So now they're all back down to the 618, you know, kind of, kind of finding support. And the interesting level to look for now is that, again, just like Bitcoin, um, that August high, you know, August high for the S&P, testing right on that, the NASDAQ not quite there yet, and the Dow has already broken below that August, where'd the August high go? Right there. So the the Dow's already broken below that level. So what you can expect when that happens is more continuation now to the downside to this 0.5 level, um, which would ultimately be, you know, when you look at the peak up here, I mean, we're only at a 5% pullback. So a 10%, you know, correction could be totally expected. That takes you right down to that, you know, uh, 3A2 level here. Sure. So it'll be very interesting to see what the markets decide to do. And again, your biggest culprit is right here that 10 year treasury yield just continuing to spike. That's pulling a lot of liquidity away from risk assets. You have the two year, uh, and, and this is all because of the Fed policy, you know, that higher for longer policy. You've got the dollar oh, continuing yeah. to rise here, uh, putting pressure on currencies around the world. And then of course you have oil, you know, still kind of hanging out, but still at these higher levels. You know, all of these things are putting pressure on markets right now because of the effects of liquidity um, you know, from global investors around the world in, in U.S. equity markets. Mm. Um, and then as far as real estate, um, you know, what are you seeing? I know sometimes it's very hyper local as far as what's happening. Uh, are we from the macro, are we cooling down a lot, you know, given the rates are so high or uh, people are still you know trying to get homes? Yeah. So there's some markets where properties are still selling in days with multiple offers because there's a lot of cash buyers out there, you know, probably. I don't know what the percentage of transactions are all cash right now, but 40% of the properties, you know, single family homes owned in the United States are, are you know, don't have a mortgage. So 40% of all houses in the United States do not have a mortgage. Out of the remaining 60%, 90% are below 6% and 20% of those are below 3%. So you have a very healthy, you know, mortgage market out there for houses right now. So with the rates going as high as they are, people just, they're not going to sell. They're not going to trade an 8% or a 3% 3, 3 mortgage rate for an 8% mortgage rate. They're just not going to do that. And in most areas, there's very little inventory. So let's say I could give you a 3% mortgage if you sold your house right now. Well, what are you going to buy? Yeah. You know, so every seller is a consumer of a housing unit, whether you're going to rent, whether you're going to buy, then, you know, in a lot of markets, there's not much options in rentals. There's not much options you know, for houses. There's not much options you know, to buy, even though people are trying to build more for rent housing, there still aren't a lot of areas where that's an available thing. So uh, until inventory levels change, which you have to increase the supply, uh, you know, one of three ways, right? You either need to build your way, you know, out of that inventory um, level, or you need more houses coming on the market, more people selling. And in order for that to happen, you need for selling. You need a reason for people to want to sell. And that could be job loss. It could be, you know, you have to move. Uh, mm -hmm. But one of the biggest issues that could force some investors to sell are rising insurance rates. So insurance are, you know, rates across the country are skyrocketing, doubling and tripling in, in, in some areas. Um, taxes are up in a lot of areas because of the appreciation we've seen in housing uh, over the last couple of years. Uh, energy costs are rising. Maintenance costs are rising. So all of those things are putting pressure on investors. So we're going to see, you know, the potential for some investors to come under pressure and start selling. But again, those are pockets, you know, uh, around the country. And and right now, typically, typically you have about two, you know, two and a half million homes on the market for sale at any given time. We're down to a million or less. You know, it's kind of bouncing on that one million level. Typically, you sell about five million houses a year. We're down to about four. So there's still, even in this environment, 4 million houses a year that are selling. But here lately, since the rates have spiked above seven, now into 8%, uh, we've seen transactions crash. I mean, I think residential transactions, I don't know what the numbers are 
this week. I'd have to look at it, but they got to be down by 50, 60 percent. Commercial transactions are down 70 to 80 percent across the board in all sectors of commercial real estate. So the rates are having an effect on transactions, definitely. And they're having an effect on inventory because even in the commercial markets, you know, those sellers are still looking at cap rates from, you know, two or three years ago where the buyers, you know, they're, they can't get there. The numbers don't work. So those transactions are just non-existent. Residential with, with the lack of inventory that we've seen, you know, transactions are way down right now. So that's putting a lot of pressure on, you know, the housing market in terms of sales. Mm. Um, final question here for you. Um, do you think we're going to have a soft landing or we're going to have a hard landing or, you know, something's going to break and then it seems like they'll have, they'll have to start cutting and maybe QE comes back. And I don't know if that's late 2024. What, what, what is your gut tell you? So that was another thing Powell said. He said that he, he said soft landing is not our base case. Mm. So even the Fed is saying our base case is not a soft landing. Uh, they would like one. They're trying to achieve one. And so far, it looks like they're succeeding. The big question out there right now is how have we not have a credit event with interest rates as high as they are? How have we not seen something crash? You know, and there's just so much. I mean, that's the thing for people to understand. Yeah. There's so much liquidity that's been pumped in the markets over the last couple of years, trillions and trillions of dollars, not just what the Fed printed, but, you know, what the government is spending, you, you know, stimulus checks, the, PP, the PPP program you know, the ERC credit, employee reduction credit, you know, that put 50 something billion, $100 billion into the economy. You know, all of the um, moratoriums on payments for rent, for mortgages, for cars, uh, for credit cards, for utilities, I mean, all those payments that were suspended, student loans, all that stuff, you know, that's all liquidity. That's all liquidity. And then you put on top of that, you know, your 401k allocations. I mean, I was looking at it this morning between 401ks and IRAs, there's there's almost twenty trillion dollars right now as of as of Q1 2023 in the markets, you know, from a value of 401ks and IRAs. That's just traditional, you know, assets. Um, so that's the biggest thing that people really need to understand. When you've gone on the path of what we've seen for appreciation of assets and the amount of liquidity that's been pumped in the market since 2009, you're talking 10, 20 trillion dollars. So it takes a while for that to kind of unwind and for that to come back into balance. So right now, it looks like the Fed is somewhat achieving that. But I think with the 10-year running off like it is and the two-year running off like it is, you know, there's some indications out there that something could potentially crack somewhere. Um, you know, is it going to be housing or commercial real estate? Those aren't really systemically big enough to really create any kind of problem. But if you combine that, with consumer credit combined with corporate debt combined with the shadow banking industry, now you got something. So it's going to take kind of all of those kind of coming together and cracking all at once. So that's your biggest potential risk for you know a major credit event if all of those things kind of start happening all at once. But man, it's like a locomotive. There's just been so much steam pumped into that engine. It's going to take a little while for that thing to come to a stop. Mm -hmm. I think we're out of the woods by 2025. Uh, you know, it's just hard to say. Um, right. It's really hard to say. This is such a unique environment. We have no benchmark for any of it, none. So you you really don't know. I mean, the thinking would be we'd have a crash by then, you know. I mean, that a lot of people are thinking we're going to have just a, you know, run up to all time highs again by the end of this year. And then it's all going to fall off a cliff going in the next couple of years. So I really don't know. What I'm looking at is, to me right now, I don't see it. Mm -hmm. Labor market is strong. People aren't losing jobs. The economy is strong. People are still spending. So I think we're going to get a lot of clarity in Q3, Q4, where the consumer really stands, uh, because all the bills are coming due. So the, you know, the pandemic revenge trade, everybody traveling abroad, uh, you know, the reopening of the world after after the lockdowns. So a lot of people took those vacations. A lot of people traveled abroad. You know, a lot of people spent a lot of money, uh, you know, over the last few months during the summer that they were otherwise spending, you know, on their house or whatever, sitting at home. Um, you've got the holidays coming up. You've got taxes that are due. You know, a lot of those forbearance on taxes, those are coming due in October. Uh, you do have some student loans that are kicking back in, but a lot of those are being, you know, they're given a grace period. You know, so there's there, there's going to be in the rising energy costs, there's going to be a lot of pressure on consumers going into Q3, Q4. So I think we're going to get a lot of color on where we really stay in Q3, Q4, and especially going into Q1 next year. 
uh, you know, to to kind of give us, you know, some guidance on where things are going to be. But you you just can't forecast it because it's just so unprecedented. Oh, yeah, for sure. But I can tell you this, ETF approvals, um, regulatory clarity, you're going to see some action in, with Bitcoin and the crypto markets. That I can guarantee you. Yeah. Um, and it, I guess the liquidity could come from other assets, right? Once ETF is approved, like allocations can be moved over to the Bitcoin ETFs. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, so people potentially would just, you know, so the 401ks never went away. So that's what's kind of kept the markets propped up in a tightening cycle is those automatic allocations, 50 billion a month or a quarter, whatever it is. It's a lot of money going into the markets on those auto allocations. So a percentage of that, you know, once those approval come, will get allocated to Bitcoin. So when you talk about the alternative asset class, you're talking of, of, you know, crypto is an alternative asset class. Bitcoin is an alternative asset, alternative to cash, stocks, bonds, you know, those type, those types of things, gold. So when you get into the alternative assets, you're talking about real estate, you're talking about art, you're talking about antiquities, uh, you know, crypto. So most investors have some portion of their portfolio allocated private equity as an alternative asset class, you know, allocated towards, you know, those alternative as assets. Some of the, you know, high net worth individuals uh, you know, especially like this group called Tiger 21, you know, that's a, that's a network of individuals around the world that have exited companies with more than $10 million in net investable capital. Um, you know, their number one allocation right now is to private equity. So once you get an ETF approval and that goes mainstream, you're going to see a lot more of those allocations from high net worth individuals and families um, and then 401ks coming into the space. And I think you're going to see five to 10%, not 1%, because once it's a legitimate spot, you know, ETF, I think that brings, like I said, all of the registered investment advisors around the country and all the wealth managers, educating their clients, exposing them to the space. And it's just going to be automatic, no matter what the market's doing, they're just going to be automatically allocating. So that arguably should keep prices higher and ultimately level off to, you know, to a point, you know, and they just kind of just like the markets and just kind of keep them going. Yeah, for sure. And especially if it's a BlackRock ETF, right? Uh, with a trusted brand, well-known brand and things like that. Well, yeah, BlackRock, Fidelity, Wisdom Tree. I mean, they're all they're all there now. You know, every every ETF, the biggest ETF, you know, funds in the world all have their applications in. So yeah, you're you're talking about a lot of potential investable capital. Mm. Greg, always great information, my friend. Thank you so much. Yeah, I enjoyed it. Thanks for having me.